Camera's rolling. Maybe I'm too young to know any better, but I guess I'm just too old to care. I'm waiting on the morning light to clear the air. What is going on, everybody? Ah, let me take this screen down. All right. Can you guys hear us all right? Good morning. Yes, I can hear you. We're light and lively. Yeah. Uh, guys, we uh, got a in-studio interview today. It's going to be a little bit different. We usually don't... Uh, we usually don't get to do it this way. I got Mr. Caleb Leverett here. How's it going, brother? I'm doing well. Ah, this I'm is still doing, alive. Still just, alive. Despite what my haters would, they just hate it when I say that, but I'm doing really, really well. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he does get some hate, guys. I don't know if you, uh, you know, I came on here and we watched the video. That was 10 years ago now? In May, it'll be 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. But I think that is probably one of the more important interviews that we've seen, uh, or not interviews. I mean, you got all this stuff documented. And it was one of those that that was my first and last time watching that video personally, because it was that triggering for me. And I think that it probably rings the same for everybody else that was watching this. There were so many of those tricks and tactics. Your ex had about 10 different personalities within that hour. She goes from happy to sad to, oh, baby, let me love you. Oh, you made a mark on my arm. I'm going to put you in the uh, I'm going to make a charge against you. It was crazy, guys. And this stuff does get crazy. Um, but really quick, before we get this started, I want you to take out your phones, whether you're on your computer or what, start hitting the like, share and subscribe button. We need it. Ding the bell. Okay. Because we're going to be having more of these conversations and the world needs to hear what we're saying. Many ways you can support the show down there at the bottom. Uh, dad talk today, no spaces, cash app, Venmo, Patreon. There's also super chats and memberships over on YouTube and the same thing on Facebook. And you got to get your dad talk today, Cubs. Got Caleb one too. I got him. Look at mine. Look there. I'm you going to so, be able to drink all that coffee? I'm so, oh no. <laughs> I got the mug. All right. Yeah. Yeah. There you go, Dwayne. That's what I'm talking it's about. Caleb, I, let, let's get into it, man. That video was 10 years ago. Can you give us kind of a, um, a brief synopsis on what was going on at that period of time when you pulled up that day with Parker and he didn't want to get out? Yeah, I had just gotten divorced for the second time. Um, I'd been picking up the kids regularly. I'd never missed a visitation. And it, it even, it's always bugged me that, you know, we're reduced to a mere visitor. But I'd never, ever, ever missed a visitation. And uh, Parker had wanted to live with me. We talked about it. Um, some things that happened besides the divorce that was hurtful enough. Um, my second ex-wife and I were, I mean, we don't keep up every day, but we're still friends. I'm still friendly with her family. Everything's great. They actually showed up at my hearing, uh, five years ago and I got custody of Parker's little brother, Blaine, but, uh, Parker had, he just wanted to live with me. And every time they'd ever asked to do that or ask for extra time, the answer was always no. We've got like a barbecue. Yeah. Like constant excuses. No, 
no, no, no. And so he was just dead set. He, you know, I got so tired of having to, my heart would break for him. You'll get him out from underneath the bed where this has been going on for years. Like, Bubba, it's time to go. And they're like, no, it just, just can we not stay a little bit longer? I said, Bubba, I'm broke. I don't have a choice. If I don't take you back, I will go to jail. So I just came up with the next best thing. I said, look, here's exactly what the papers say. It says that I must return you at this date, at this time, at this address. It doesn't say I have to kick you out. Yeah. I am a proponent of nonviolent parenting. I don't spank my kid. Well, they're all grown now, but I didn't spank my kids. Regrettably, I spanked a couple of them a couple times. Uh, but once I got divorced and sent dad game into the picture and started manhandling my kids and uh, spanking my kids, I just made up my mind then and there. I'll never touch my kids ever, ever again. I never did. So. Uh, dude, so you just brought up something and I was talking about this yesterday. You talk about simp dad. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I was more mad at when I was watching that video. Your ex or the man sitting there in his football shirt just watching over you the whole time. And there was even an intimidation there with Parker, too. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you went through with that guy? Uh, sent down? Yeah. Um, well, there's only so much I can say. But, I got you. Um, I guess I can say this. You do not, young people, you do not want to aspire to grow up to be a simp. Nope. If if you get involved with a woman whose kids are involved with their dad's life, you're better off just walking away because you're not you're stepping on my territory. Right. Because, you know, she and I didn't get along well enough. We got along apparently well enough to make four kids together. Four kids, together, <laughs> four kids together, but our separation was our separation. And I didn't divorce my kids. I divorced her. Right. And as far as uh, I would get word from the kids, I guess you could say, I hate hearsay, but I don't really have a, I don't have anything to lose now um, that he would manhandle them, spank them, put them in timeout, do what he's told get him in trouble you know that sort of thing and i didn't i just wasn't putting up with it just watching the gaslighting that went on with parker at that point in time you know he sat there quiet for the most most part and she was doing all the talking but then you know i, I even had some people that showed up when we were showing it yesterday and it was like we don't know what the whole story was you know this is the wrong way to do it but then you start hearing parker say you hit me she's like yeah i did and i'm gonna do it again i'll do it again if you would have said that in front of the cops, Caleb, if you would have been standing on the other assume, side, what would have happened? Assume the position. Oh, my I'd, God. I'd, I'd been on the hood. You would have. Oh, but yeah. then you start seeing what Parker's going through. And just so you guys understand, you know, again, 10 years, he's been doing this for a long time. Can we all give him a round of applause for still speaking up? His kids are older. But this is one of those cases. You probably documented it better than anybody I've ever seen. And everybody can look back and see what what was going on there. But just to give you a little clarification, because I'm learning about this story as well. Parker was not the only child. You have several children with this woman. Yes, they're all, right. all I've got Parker and Hayden and Blaine and London. And they are all two years apart. The last three were all born in June, uh, two years apart. So did you I'm guessing you had se separate challenges with each one of them? Um, after the divorce. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It seems like every time another kid turned 14, you know, Hayden didn't, I mean, he's probably my least confrontational kid. He'd, he'd rather get along. Yeah. Which is admirable in its own way. I've just got two of my kids, uh, Parker and Blaine, who happen to be as hammer headed as their mother and me combined. I mean, gee, I wonder where they get it. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, as they get older, they just they find out who they are and they're all a little different. I thought after my, you know, three boys I had, then London came along. Well, she can't be that much different. <laughs> they are. They're all different. They all have their own ideas. And so. 
what was that like for you every time that you would go to take those kids back and you would hear the angst in their voices not wanting to go i know that has to just crush you inside as a father crush me crush me once parker was taken from me and uh two and a half months later in parker versus the man um the very first trip i ever made to san antonio because when you see parker get in the car they instantly took his unhappy ass all the way to 350, 375 miles away to San Antonio, Texas, that, that very moment. And I had to go pick him up. And once I got him, it, it was, it was, it was nice. They, there was, I knew I had to make some kind of continuity. I will be there kids. I don't care what it costs me. I'll be there. We don't have long, but I'll be there. And I did it. And then that first time I dropped them off, and I had on a Sunday, that I don't know, six o'clock or whatever, I had to drive my unhappy ass all the way back to Odessa. I don't think I stopped crying until I hit Odessa. It was the most gut wrenching thing to just like, are they, how, how, how am I going to keep this up? You know, they've still, you know, they're at the time 14, 12, 10, and eight. I'm like, those are those prime years where they need their father the most. They need my influence. How am I ever going to maintain this? And I almost didn't. So. I know that had to be hard, man. What What do you think made her that way in that confrontation to where this was going on? I, I don't know that I don't know that you got an answer for I or that one you can say. Not one that I can say. I got you. Um, People just are who they are uh, without obviously being able to say too much. I can say this. I tell young people all the time, A, consider not getting married young or, or even not married young, young or at all. Consider not having children young or at all. And the reason is you might just wind up with a polar opposite because when you're young, I didn't even know what a narcissist was until after I got divorced. I never, I might have heard the term, but it wasn't thrown around like, like, it, is th like it is now. Yeah. Now it's thrown around like, ah, he's a narcissist. Well, a narcissist is not simply an asshole that you don't like. That is not a narcissist. <laughs> Narcissists are very intelligent. They rarely make common mistakes. And they are hard to identify if you don't know what to look for. And so in order for you not to get stuck with one in a contract, a social contract, like, you know, I don't know, making a baby with them, don't get married young until you are completely certain that you that mean that you're not in bed literally with a narcissist. But Satan. Do what? <laughs> Satan. Satan. Yeah. <laughs> That's about what I call it, man. Because uh, once, because they'll give you that smile, and then once they got, oh, yeah. once you got that contract signed, those hooks go in, and they are sharp. Oh, yes, they are, and it feels almost impossible to get out of it, brother. They're, I, I, they're hard to there. beat. How old were you when you got married? Uh, twenty. Twenty. Yeah. You're still a kid. I was a kid. I was eight. Dang. It. I can, I can sympathize. And, you know, I think one of the uh, big things that we got to start doing in this movement is warning the younger generation of these traps. Uh, talking to each other, a lot of times we kind of know what's going on, but uh, don't rush your life, guys. Don't, because you might end up in one of these situations. And I tell you, it is not fun. It's not fun at all. As bad as the battle was with Parker, though, I had some friends that have followed your story for a while. Dwayne Robert, mutual friend of ours from Dad Surviving Divorce. And he was telling me, Eric, you, you saw the story with Parker, but you haven't seen the one with Blaine. He's like, I think the one with Blaine might be even worse. I just can't imagine this getting any worse. What went on with Blaine? Blaine was 13, about to be 14, and uh, I've documented all this as well. He just simply wanted to live with me. And he would call, and I would do my regular trips from Odessa down to San Antonio. Odessa down to San Antonio. Well, he was started calling me. He was he just couldn't stand staying in the house. And he would, and I've again, I've got all this document on my channel. He would call and say, Dad, I just can't handle it i i, I just I, I can't i just want to come live with you and the answer is always no 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 well he wound up 
living in the streets at age 13, staying the night under uh, uh, bridges. He knew some of the homeless people. When I go pick him up, he go, yeah, I know that guy. And like I said, the homeless guy? He goes, yeah, they're real nice. I said, how do you know him? Just slept under the bridge a few times. Like, he was sleeping under the bridge. Oh, just, he wanted to be away from home that bad. According to him, he and I don't have any reason to doubt him. Um, the kid's street smart. Well, he wound up getting arrested multiple times. I think he was putting handcuffs at the hand of his own mother about eight times in two weeks. One of those times uh, he was thrown into the juvenile detention jail. It was just full-blown jail, kid jail, but jail nonetheless. Um, and twice he was thrown into the Knicks hospital. Uh, the, oh, I think it's the second time I caught the, the final arrest I caught on video. It's, uh, it's in the Blaine series on my channel. Um, it's hard to see, but. You know, he did get arrested and the cop was belligerent as hell. And they just, they threw him in the nut house. It's called Nick's Hospital. And I just could not believe Parker 2.0. This is happening again. I'm like, did you not learn anything from the first time this happened? And so at that point, I just said, screw it. Um, I don't care how big of a fool I make of myself. I don't care how silly I think. People think I look, I couldn't care less. I've got my happy ass up to Walmart. I've got some big poster board and markers, and I just made myself a good old fashioned protest sign. Um, hashtag free Blaine. Uh, my son needs his dad, not, uh, you know, not cuffs and meds. So I protested, I protested there a uh, couple times, actually, in Nick's hospital. They, In fact, the cops knew I was coming this one one time, and I've got it on camera. I, I, hadn't, I just barely pulled in, and they're rushing up to me. Oh, you can't park here. You can't park here. Like, how the? It's, it's, a, it's a hospital. You mentioned meds. All right. So, and I, I go back to the Parker video where she was talking about military school at one point, anger management and all these things. What are some of the things they were trying to do with the kids? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it sounded like maybe the same thing was going on with Blaine. Well, he had allegedly, according to that cop, get got caught with dope. And with so, dope. well, and so I asked that cop, well, "What do you mean?" And he's trying to bullshit me, trying to get me to say something that I know good and well. I mean, I'm not gonna, you know throw my kid under the bus or say anything that right. get him in trouble. And so I didn't know, you know, what's dope. I said, you tell me, I, what, what do you mean dope? So anyway, he wound up getting thrown in there and force fed a billify. Basically they just uh -huh. put you in that nut house and strap you down to a gurney and have these big, you know, uh, orderlies come up and said, you either swallow those or we're basically going to beat the shit out of you. So we would rather all of this stuff happen, them go to all these different places than to come be with their dad. Than come be with dad. That's all I want. What Stay does that say, there. guys? I mean, that kind of speaks in and of itself, if you ask me. Uh, somebody said it sounds a lot like Rust and Wright situation. I know you know Rust. I do. That, that situation is pretty similar. And I, I believe Rustin just got custody of mm -hmm. his son there in Texas. Well, he turned 18. And it, unfortunately, he had to turn 18 in order to do, even just hug his own son. And guys, I bring that up because even with Caleb's situation, they'll think that this is a one-off. I can tell you nope. right now it's not. Caleb's got video of it, and that's what makes this situation unique. I'm glad you brought that up. That's what I tell people all the time. What happened to me and what happened to my kids is by far not unique. It's the norm. It happens it is. every single day in every single town in the entire United States all the time. The only difference is... I held up my phone and got and just caught assholes manhandling my kids. That's the only difference. And notice you don't ever see the news media like kids getting locked up in juvie all the time. Where's the news media? A kid just wants to be with dad or in some cases dad is the prick. They just want to go live with their mom. And do you see the news media anywhere? No. And it's not because it doesn't make ratings. Now they could say that on some of these shows. 
but your channel has millions and millions of views where people were watching this. And I believe it's because people could relate to what was going on. They could have got ratings off of that if that's what they're wanting. They're wanting to sell advertising. But when it comes to these family law issues and fatherlessness, they stay away. And I have to believe there's a reason behind that. It is. It's it is definitely it always comes back to money. It's all about the money. You know, go back to go back to the video. And I keep hearing mom like every time he would say uh he wanted to come with you. Yeah, you just don't know who he is. Well, who is he, mom? Well, you know, you don't need to know that because you're young, and that was usually the way that she gets off of that. But every time, like, yeah, but how about your pot, Caleb? You know, are you giving money for the pot? These smears that you were facing. What was that like to just, I know, I mean, it was classic gaslighting. Yeah, it was. Um, I just learned to embrace it. Learned to embrace I, it. I, I figured I had watched enough police accountability videos by that time. I just figured out the people who capture this and highly edit it rarely get any traction. Because the first question that comes to everybody's mind, well, what happened between here and here and here and here and here and here? Right. Well, yeah, yeah, I can understand editing out an address or a phone number, but people over edit. So I just decided I don't care what she throws at me. I'm not going to edit any of this. this Which in one of the videos happened with your phone number. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. We're not telling you which one. Well, that had to be. It, it's still out there and I still, that's why I have to keep it on silent because I still get phone calls from it. And I can imagine, man. What was some of the challenges you were going through outside of when this battle was coming on? Were you struggling with substance abuse, depression? Yep. Yep. I mean, tell us about that battle. Cause a lot of people, they hear about the family law battles, but the reason why conversations like what me and you are having right now, I think is so important. We talk, look, this is a common situation. It happens. And people don't, if they haven't been through it, they don't know what's going on up here. What was going on up here for you at that time? At the time, I was not a pothead. I don't even like pot even to this day. It's just not my thing. Nothing against pot. If, yep. you're, if you're a pothead, by all means. I've got loads of pothead friends. It just wasn't for me. <laughs> However, yeah, I felt I succumbed to alcohol. I was a full-blown professional alcoholic. Uh, I mean, I drank socially before the Parker vs. the Man movie. But on that very day, when Parker was taken from me, stolen out, like right out of my arms and put in sent Dad's truck, that right there, I just, A, I gave up on God. And coming from a background, I was raised in a Baptist church. Yeah. Like day in, day out. Mom always had us in church and... uh I made up my mind that either God is not real or he is most definitely not benevolent and caring and loving because why in the, you know, it's one thing to punish me, but a 14 year old, I just, I, I gave up. And so I went home, I told my mother I was going to do it. I said, I'm going home and I'm getting face drunk. And they're like, no, no, no. And I wasn't going to listen to them. And I regret it. I, I regret it. Now, what happened the next day after getting drunk and you woke up? Because I've, I've, I've been through a similar battle. And people think it's because you just like the drugs or you like the alcohol. No, a lot of times you're trying to drown out what's I'm going on up here. To, I was trying to drown it out. Alcohol is, yes. in the short run is great for that. It's mm -hmm. great for forgetfulness, make you laugh at silly things, make you do silly things you wouldn't normally do. But as I would, I would keep drinking every night because of my depression. Well, as time went on, I got to the point I wasn't depressed. I just had been drinking so long. That's how I went to sleep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the depression started to cease. The kids are getting older. Uh, you know, the, they couldn't put their thumb on them. Uh, and control them or even quite control me as much, but I'd made a habit out of it. I couldn't go to sleep without it. So after I recovered from the depression side, I kept going. I would have done pot had pot been legal, but I was absolutely terrified of getting another effing drug test. 
Yeah. Samantha and I, my second wife and I, I think we submitted 22, 24 uh, drug tests in a matter of just a couple of years, uh, both hair follicle and piss tests over and over constantly being accused of being a bad influence and, you know, having, you know, cannabis in our systems. By the way, they all came back clean every single time. But that's part of the reason Samantha left is basically she just couldn't stand it. And to be quite honest with her, I don't blame her. Yeah, I, I don't blame her for leaving. I'm glad it hurt like all hell when she did leave. But you got to I don't. I mean, I talked about this, but at one point, not only was I sued again and drug into court, but my then wife, Samantha, who is mentioned in the Parker movie as if it was some you know, cheating thing I did. I wasn't cheating on her with Samantha. I was married to Samantha. We married after they got married, like a couple months or a month or two. Anyways, not only was I sued again. But Samantha was drug into it, and both of Samantha's parents were drug into it. And we were all four accused in open court of sexual misconduct of my then two-year-old daughter, London, which, come to find out, was, uh, that was her Gigi. London didn't know the difference. She didn't know she wasn't blood. That was, her, that was her Gigi. That was her grandma. There was a thunderstorm one night. London got scared, ran to Gigi's. Mike's over there with this CPAP on or whatever. And she's just like, okay, London, it's okay. Just go to bed. Okay, so London just crashed in the middle of the bed. Well, hi, sweetie. How was your weekend at Daddy's? I slept in Gigi's bed. Oh, that turned into open court accusations of sexual misconduct of me of Samantha and both of her parents. And after it wasn't too long after that, she left. And again, I don't blame her. I'm glad she missed out on the rest of the misery that I had to go through because she didn't deserve any of that. Had not you saying, not went through that family court battle and the things she was going through, do you think that relationship would still be going? Mm. I know hindsight's 2020 20, might not be uh, worth it. Probably. I would say there's a real good chance. Good chance. A very, very good chance. Because we got along great. We didn't, we had some, we had a couple fights, one really big fight. But, you know, uh, compared to my previous marriage of 10 years, we were great. I mean, yeah. Going on road trips, weekend trips, watching, binge watching TV shows. We, we, it was, we had fun. We had a lot of fun. I can only imagine what it's been like for you speaking up about this with the detractors and people pushing back with it. But anytime we speak about father's rights or the challenges that dads go through, you're bashing women or you hate women. And no, we do not. No. There's a certain type of woman. I mean, even look, he, he was remarried, guys. But there are some very strong women in this movement. It could be stepmoms. It could be moms that's got kids that are going through it, grandmas. But I don't think the stepmoms get enough credit. I mean, I was stepping back, looking at this, I know you, you two aren't together anymore, but what were some of the challenges that Samantha had to go through being with you? And I mean, she doesn't have nothing to do with this other than she's with you. Uh, what, we, what was the strain that that put on her? Well, the big one was getting sued and all four of us being drugged into court. Fortunately, yep. uh, Judge Den Whalen, he's the one who later, many years later, stole Parker from me. Yeah. But at the time, I have to give Judge Whalen credit. He's the one that like saw through this and he just dismissed it. I have to give him credit for it. It was obviously BS. And I'm glad you brought that up about, you know, being a, you know, people, some people, if they catch a certain part of me on YouTube, they'll think, well, he's just a misogynist. He must hate all women. That is absolutely patently false. And I can prove it. Uh, in 2017, July 21st, as a matter of fact, I was sued for the final time, and it backfired, and I won. And coincidentally, I've never been sued since. Mm -hmm. But on that day, well, that we went to court two or three times. Blaine had acting up. I was protesting. She sued me. Big shocker. Again. Like, again, I was getting sued. Um, but when I went, to, we finally went to court. Um July 21st, 2020, Judge Sarah Kate Billingsley, whom I hold in the highest esteem, 
was the, our presiding judge. And out of the 27 people in the court sitting on my side, 23 of them were all mothers. Mm. That was powerful. Uh, dude, people yes. knew my story. Yeah. They knew my care. And most of these are, are women that I went to school with, like high school. I hadn't seen most of them in years. Yeah. They just knew my story. And they're like, you know, Caleb's a little different. He's a little weird. And yes, I know I'm weird. I'm a libertarian <laughs> anarchist. I'm open about it. I know it's I'm weird as they come. I know I am. Yeah. But I'm open about it. But the fact that they would go out of their way to show up and stand in solidarity with three other men, also whom I either went to school with or were friends with at the time, to show up and say, and, and including out of those 23 mothers, my own second ex-wife, Samantha, showed up. Her, oh, man. My own former mother-in-law, Gigi, she showed up and sat on my side. And so you can only imagine how uh, high of an esteem I hold that family. I love that family. Again, we don't talk all the time. Occasionally, I would bump into them. But if I ever ran into them, or if they call or called me up and said, Caleb, I need you, I will drop everything to be there for their family. Because I love her. I love that family. They're, they're wonderful people. They, they spent time with me. They basically adopted all my kids. Not, not legally, but. Whenever we married, she was like, oh, my gosh, you know, Gigi went from no grandkids to <laughs> Insta family, four grandkids. And we had a we had a great time. That is awesome, man. I, uh, you know, I, I just have to think like you have been through this with your kids. Now your marriage is breaking up. That's got to be a dark moment. It was. <laughs> yeah. tell, all right. Tell us how that was a little bit different. I'm sure that had to go even further. Did you get worse into the alcohol and everything else at that point in time? Yeah, I think she left uh, spring of 2012. Uh, the night before, um, my cousin, all I can say is he passed away. Uh, a week later, we had our family reunion. My grandmother was literally twirling practicing twirling because she's a twirler just like my mom and her twin sister were twirlers and right in front of our very eyes she died of a heart attack just right there and all this all this the two deaths plus her leaving it just sent me over the edge i i was so hurt about what was going on that i began drinking quite a bit but i still kept it together long enough to do with the stuff with my kids but when parker was taken from me that was it i hated the world uh briefly i'm open about this i, I was a misogynist i hated all women all every single female human being on earth except for london i hate them all i was so angry and so bitter you and i were talking earlier about um you know the migtow um it was the migtow men that saw my story and basically picked me up. Um, I know MGTOW gets a, a bad rap and justifiably so in some cases. A lot of them, let's face it, a lot of them kind of are misogynistic. But I will say this, for the MGTOWers that are out there who found me, it sure was a nice landing spot. Was it? Like crash down, my son taken from me right in front of my very eyes i was so angry and i didn't want to talk to any women i didn't want to, i didn't really want to talk to anybody but uh i just had a bunch of men reach out and say you know what the, the, I, I i feel you brother uh, paul elam of all people wrote a really really nice article my about <laughs> wrote a really really nice article about us um and it was nice to have that again, that soft landing, you know, a depressed man that just, I wanted some comfort. Like, yeah, we've been through it, man. We've yeah. been through it. As I grew, I started realizing the nature of the beast. The, uh, if I kept up this cycle of depression and drinking and hatred of half the planet, where was I going to, where was I going to get me? And so I outgrew it. I just, you know, 
again, it's an it's a nice soft landing, but I just I knew I couldn't stay there, and I hope I encourage people to not stay at that because let's just face it, there's not a whole lot of that comes a lot of good that comes from hate, constant hate. It, there's not. And I think a lot of people probably end up in that space from going through these bad situations and like, I'm not going to go through that again. I've seen what it does. And uh, I don't want that. If I don't get married, I don't get in relationships. I'm not going to go through that again. At the same time, Caleb, like I understand why men go their own way. I and, and a lot of you guys, if you're doing it, you're doing your self-preservation. That's fine. And I'm glad you're here. And we, I'd love to talk to you. And I'd say a lot of these guys that have been through these bad relationships, like Caleb saying, it's a good landing spot. So, Sit there and take care of yourself for a minute. And at the same time, some of the, you know, the, the red pillars, they, they get on to me as well, which I couldn't care less. Um, most of my friends are all women. They just always have. I, yeah. I, they, the ones that were there for me, like my guardian angel in uh, the Atlanta area, where where I'm staying now. I've, she and I have known each other for 10 years. Awesome. Literally 10 years. We just finally met. Um, she helped me out. In fact, that very first, uh, <laughs> that very first trip to, to San Antonio when I was like lost and broke and had to take off work suddenly after not having, I only got five days to prep for it. I had to take off that Friday just so I could get there on time. She had already had like a bazillion travel miles and she bought and paid for the entire top penthouse of, I don't remember the Marriott, maybe big time right at the downtown river walk. I mean, it was just to die for. And she just did it out of the kindness of her heart. She'd seen the Parker movie. And we became friends again, having never met each other. We didn't meet till uh, literally this week. It was the very first time we've ever met. That is crazy, man. Cause, and, and I can identify with this. This might shock some people, but I know when you would see this situation, you're probably thinking it's all MGTOW red pill guys, which I know we got those. And for good reason, how many of your supporters was women? Well, for starters, the 23, that the 23 showed up in court, but I'm talking about the ones you didn't know that showed up on that channel. Oh, about, I think 45% of my, uh, last time I checked my, my channel is 45% are all women. Same thing here. Oh, real? Oh, yeah. The reason we got this studio and we're doing what we're doing. Is well, that actually doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. It doesn't. Because no. the thing about mothers is we've all got one. Yeah. And the thing about mothers who have sons, if you are in support of the way men are being treated now, guess what's going to happen? Chances are, ch what's going to happen to your son? That's right. He's going to get roped into the family court and, and run through the muck just like the rest of <clears throat> the rest of us do. So I think that is why so many mothers, women, are actually on our side on this. It's not a man versus woman that, 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 no. that, that is my big deal. It, I believe me, and you're about the only other. Well, there's a few others. There's a few of us that I know. You and I are in the position I would know firsthand that there are good mothers out there that get mm -hmm. screwed just as bad as we do. I know that happens. It is also a fact that it happens to fathers more often. And it's simply because traditionally, who the who's the breadwinner? Traditionally, yeah. When Title IV D funding came into be in the early 70s, who was the breadwinner in the 70s? Nine times out of 10, there you go. Nine times out of 10, it was uh, the, 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 the father. And so that's where the money is. Oh, yeah, man. Um, what are some of the challenges that you faced? over this past 10 years, once those videos came out and speaking up about it, talk about the detractors. But uh, when some of these people show up, they're there to shut you up. And I mean, I could even see it yesterday that there was people that could sit there and see everything that Parker was saying, everything the mom was doing. And they're still trying to figure out what was Caleb's part in this. He had, he had to stage this. Uh, Parker, Parker couldn't have been doing this on their own. They're trying to find the one place that you're wrong instead of seeing all the signs smacking them in the face. Um, yeah, I get accused of coaching my kids all the time. Yep. I didn't coach my kids. I've got a video on my channel where I've talked about this. I was a parent to my kids. 
I taught my sons how to defend themselves. I taught my sons the non-aggression principle, which basically is the old golden rule of the Bible. Uh, treat thy fellow carbon-based life forms as you would want to be treated. And that's about it. With Parker engaging in civil, civil, civil disobedience, I'll tell you where that came from. I was big into the police accountability. And I'm still kind of into it, but not nearly like I was back then. I still think that we have a policing problem and it's no big secret. You know, they shoot about 3000 Americans a year or something like that. Um, maybe that's a little high. Maybe it's 1100. Yeah. I'm Allegedly gonna... opinion. Oh, about 1100. <laughs> Anyways, um, we went to, I took Parker the day before he was taken from me. I went to a police accountability summit in Austin, Texas. And there speaking was a man by the name of Bobby Seal. And Bobby Seal, if you don't know, is one of the original founders, co-founders of the original Black Panther Party. And the original Black Panther Party basically has nothing to do with the modern Black Panther Party. They're, they're, they're completely different. The Black Panther Party was an organized in, within the black community in the 60s to defend their families, defend their communities against police, police brutality. Um, and Bobby Seale was one of them. Well, Bobby Seale was a speaker there in Austin in 2013. He was the keynote speaker. And I took Parker and I didn't know how he's going to react, but Bobby got up there and he was in his, I want to say at least early mid seventies, even back then the man had fire in his belly. Did he? And I looked over at Parker and he was on the edge of his chair talking of giving firsthand testimony of what it was like to be chained up in a court of law and still speaking the truth, even though his voice shook and he would just, he would jump up and the <laughs> like pretend he had cuffs on. He was, and he would go, you know, you're not going to silence me. You will not silence me. And he just went on and on about civil disobedience learning what the law is. That's what they did. They learned the gun laws. They educated their community about the gun laws. And when they saw police, you know, brutalizing someone within their community, they showed up legally armed and basically they didn't have cameras back then, but holding these cops. Okay. If you, we're watching you and if, if you do something illegal, we're going, we're going to defend in our own. But anyway, the point is Parker saw that. And the very next day we had court, uh, or that was on a Saturday. I think we spent the night and the, that following Monday we had court. Well, he just loved, we got to meet Bobby seal. In fact, if you watch, uh, Parker versus the man at the end, there's credits, uh, where I'm showing a bunch of, you know, pictures of me and the kids, you know, stuff that we did. Bobby seals in there with Parker and me, we got our picture made. We got to meet him, like living history. Oh, man. And so I can only assume since he had just seen Bobby Seal, and that's what he did. He decided he just walked out there after he realized that they got me. He, he just sat his unhappy ass down in that parking lot. I don't know how I got off. I think I got off a little bit on. on oh, you're question. good, man. I'm sorry. I, I do that. No, 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 no. I, I do, do it that too. a lot. I do it too. No, that that was good. You know, seeing that that civil disobedience. I mean, Parker was a fighter. Well, that, I'm sorry. That that's you asked about the people said people say I coached him. Yeah. No, we. I just taught him how to defend his rights. You you've got every right in the world as a 14 year old. You can. It's not like he was asking to go live with a stranger uh, across the country or overseas. He wanted to live with his dad, who happened to, at the time live five minutes away. That's all he's asking. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. And so he stood, he stood up for his rights. And I, again, I, I just don't understand it, guys. If you had to watch that video when he's talking about she punched me, she's choked me. If that would have been you, that would have been a much different scenario. This wouldn't. But the police, let's get on the police for a second. That was one of the things I was watching, too. That first police showed up. Tell her that, you know, if you pull him out of the car and stuff, there's nothing I can do. And then 
he he was doing nothing about it. He was supposed to de-escalate the conflict. He's sitting there watching over it. That second police officer showed up, and he was a rock star. Rocha. I liked him, Officer Rocha. But, but why was there two different opinions with the cops? Aren't they supposed to abide by the law? What was going on with that? I'm glad you brought that up because of all people, I, the people that know me, they know I'm very very highly critical of police, and. This is what I have to say about Officer Brandon Speaks. He was the first one that showed up. And then Officer Rocha. I don't know his first name. I never found out. Um, Speaks showed up. And yeah, he was had a differing opinion of Rocha. And a lot of people say, you know, thank God for Officer Rocha. He came in and saved the day. But I will say this. For a man in Officer Brandon Speaks' position to be involved with something they obviously did not want to be in in the first place to get corrected on the fly with a with a camera in your face and take it like a man instead of getting all beefy and huffy puffy and you'll know, punch the you know is you know or whatever you know we all know that happens cops just you know they get this you know big dick contest he took it like a man and he said oh they changed it and then he goes, well, by golly, I stand corrected. And so I have to give him props. Oh, those okay. those officers showed up as peace officers, in my opinion. They showed up to a situation they obviously didn't want to be at because they know there's really nothing they could do. It's a civil matter. They showed up. They assessed the situation. They de-escalated the situation. And no one got hurt. And feelings don't count. No one got hurt and they left. It was brilliant. It was beautiful. I would love to see if we have to have a police force the way the Americans just love cops. Peace officers, man. That that they kept the peace. Nobody got hurt. They 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 turned around and left. Yeah. So I, I give uh, both officers Spinks and Rocha credit for doing that. Absolutely. Now when Parker went inside the house and the mom followed him. I know he said something about she shut the door, tried to block him in. What happened inside of that house? Or did he did he tell you what went on? I, you know, obviously I wasn't there. So, yeah, I, he was already spitting truth at the at the time. So yep. pretty much whatever he said, uh, she tried to hold me up and pin me in my room or whatever. I just I don't think he had a reason to lie at that point. Um, I don't either. Uh, your guess is good as mine. Yeah. Now, what happened afterwards? Did you? How long did you get to keep Parker? Two and a half that? months. Two and a half months. Two and a half months. Okay. Uh, it was about the greatest summer of my life. Um, and I didn't even up. I uploaded the video, but it didn't. I it stayed dormant for like a week and a half, two weeks. I wasn't. I wasn't going to go live with it. I was using it as basically leverage. Look, hey, work with me here. I obviously have everything on camera. Come on, work with me here. Work with me. Well, Simp Dad wound up basically trespassing on my land, putting out letters and, you know, love notes saying we miss you, Parker. And that just pissed Parker off. Uh. Well, Parker, <laughs> he, I was taking him to school. He wound up throwing the big the cardboard love letter in the trash. Well, when I went and picked him back up, we pull up. They had dug in our trash and pulled it back out and wrote on the sign. We still love you. And that was it. Once you've trespassed and dug in my in trash, that was it. I went my happy ass. I went click. At the time, I had about 100, 120 subscribers. Any video I had at the time might have had 100, maybe 150 views. I went live and I went and picked up the kids that evening because it was my weekend. Didn't even look at it. Went to bed. The next day, we were on our way to my parents' uh uh, Ridosa house for you know a little vacation, a little uh, three day, four day weekend or something. And I wake up and oh my god, I had like seventy five hundred views overnight. And I was like, people either really love me or they really hate me. I don't know. I wasn't sure. I didn't know. And you know, the rest is history. You know, I think we're in a much different landscape right now. People can call it Hollywood or whatever they want. But the Johnny Depp case was very, uh, very good for this movement. Yeah. I believe it, it It brought it out. And your case has some of those elements, if you ask me, because we can watch your video and everybody. Oh, that's my ex. Same way with Amber Heard. 
but it's a little bit more accepted now. If we go back 10 years ago, some of this wasn't being pushed back against as bad as it is now. Mm -hmm. what, what was the differences in talking about this when you first started versus now? If you questioned, even questioned the validity of child support, you were looked at like you had three heads. And even as recent as 2016 or 17, I made a video where I defended Johnny Depp back then, and it was not popular. Mm. Like, Caleb Lever, I've liked you all these years, but he's obviously a woman beater. I was like, I've seen this behavior. I know this. I just have a gut feeling we're not getting the full story here. And I took a beating. I, bet. I took a, a brutal beating on my YouTube channel for actually defending Johnny Depp. Now, come to find out, I get people that are, you know, going through you know, Johnny videos because it was the number one story uh, all last year. Yep. They find mine are like, whoa, dang, uh, this Caleb Lever guy, he's he was defending Johnny Depp back in 2016, 2017. Like, whoa, it's like, yeah, it's almost like I've seen this, this type of narcissistic bullshit behavior before. I can smell them a mile away. And uh, Amber Heard has got it <laughs> written all over her forehead. She does, man. That's what I say. Like, you know, this is why I hate politics so much. That, that whole time I'm going across the country, going to these political conferences. How do we get some answers behind this? You need to go educate your judges. You need to go educate your attorneys as to what's going on in the family court system. You're telling me that people that work in it every day have to hear from one of us parents as to what's going on inside that system. Bull crap. They know exactly what. Bull crap. And and talking about being educated, just from you know your activism and what you've been doing with it, I've only been doing it three years. You can you can spot it a mile away because they play the same damn tricks. It's mm -hmm. not that hard to spot if they would actually pay attention. I don't think they want to pay attention to what's going on. No, there's no financial reason for them to pay attention to us. Yeah, I know you had your run in with some of the political figures. Mm -hmm. Can you speak about that? What went on with the politics? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, educating judges, to me, in my opinion, pointless. Uh, humiliating judges is just invaluable. I learned a lot from a man that I don't see his name around a lot anymore that I really want to give credit to a lot of fathers. Dwayne might, have, might, might know it. Uh, ben Vonderheide. Ben Von Vonderheide is the, the real true pioneer of the modern day holding up your camera and filming the assholes doing the dirty deeds. Not only did he film his ex-wife, he filmed judges. He walked in. He learned the law, much like the Black Panther Party did. He learned what the the elite, what his rights were about filming in public. He fought. He'd had one point where he would. I interviewed him one time, like this. I think it was bef either right before, or right after the Parker movie went viral. Um, he had a, a, a billboard printed or put on a a, a, a float. That said, Judge so and so, you know, hates kids and or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was. And he drove it in a circle around the courthouse, and he got video of people hating on him, like punching him, punching him through his window. And then he also got people handing him five dollar bills, saying, "Keep going, keep going. You're humiliating him. Keep going." That inspired me. I'm like, that's how you get to people through humor. Through mocking, uh, satire is one of the greatest tools that we could ever hope to ask for. Uh, satire has been around for eons and eons. When you can't reason with the judge, like you know, like they say, go, you might need to go educate your judges on what's going on. They know exactly what's going on. They do. I They're then paid. The only way you're going to get their attention is if you mock them and uh, humiliate them if they're acting out. Uh, Judge Den Whalen wound up having to recuse himself because uh, a member of Anonymous made a video and threatened him. I had nothing to do with it. I'm not condoning what they did. I know better than to, you don't get anywhere with threats. It's against the law. You will go to prison, and as you should, because you can't make threats. Right. But I didn't do it. 
the Texas Rangers got involved and I mean, I don't know. I don't know if they ever caught the guy. The video has been taken down, but when Waylon, uh, he recused himself, uh, you know, the day I got kicked out of jail or put in, no, see, I've got my own Mandela effect going. I always get this mixed up. Somehow I made it to the front page or my name made it to the front page on April fool's day of all days, 2014, when I got out of jail that Waylon found out about it and had to recuse himself. But anyways, um, where are we going with that? Uh, political. Just, just talking about, you know, the politics, how you the got politics. involved into the politics. Uh, later, it became my beef with uh, deadbeat Ken Paxton, the attorney general of Texas. Um, I had won custody of blame, primary custody, that is. Um, or I was awarded primary custody. I have to say that right. I was awarded primary custody of blame with the right to designate his residence. July 21st, uh, 2017. The paperwork did not get updated all the way till December. And then December, my bank account got seized by the attorney general's office. I'm like, for what? Well, you haven't paid. Y'all hadn't got the paperwork. I won. I was awarded. I was awarded to be paid child support. Judge Sarah Kate Billingsley awarded me that. I was awarded uh, having to meet halfway to San Antonio which uh, of something I'd never, ever had before. I always made the full trip. They didn't get the paperwork done, and it was a mess that didn't get solved till December 6th of last year. It went on for five years, and it never got resolved. Now, how many times did you try to contact them in that period of time? Paxton? Yeah. Um, you can't talk to the attorney general's office in the state of Texas if you have an attorney on retainer. Mm. That's another way they get you. You could have just the most simple, basic question. Nope, you got to go through your attorney. He charges 400 bucks an hour. I just need a simple, nope, nope. If you've got a, return, a, a retainer, or an attorney on retainer, we can't talk to you. But this, this is the problem with the money inside of our marriages, inside of our parenting, with our kids. No good father that's wanting to be there for their kids should have to be going through that in the first place. Nope. There should not be a price tag put on your families. I'm talking about this with Ken, make it make sense. He's been on this show twice. I've, I've talked to him. We've, we've had these discussions, but I'll have to be honest with you. I hear a story is like what you went through and it don't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me other than it seems like this system is all about money. It's all about shaming the dad so that he'll keep going through that system so that he'll pay that $400 an hour to talk to that attorney mm -hmm. just to go in there to create more conflict so you can keep those hours building and then, up. And then when you ask him, like Dead B. Paxton, you know, any kind of questions about it, well, I, you know, I feel sorry for you. Um, I just... I, my hands are tied. I mean, I just enforce the law. You've, you've got to go to your legislature. Okay. <laughs> what good's that going to do? They don't, found, they don't listen either. Have you found any sympathy from any of the legislators? <sighs> Not really. Yeah, he had to think about that. That says enough. No. Um, Paxton's, uh, his campaign manager reached out to me. Uh, back in 2018, because I was raising such hell, come to find out she was just trying to put a Band-Aid on it. Um, Michelle Smith. Um, I know her. Yep. Knew you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Rustin knows her. I think Dwayne knows her. Um, I made her life kind of a living hell. But, you know, that's what you get when you go to work for a freaking crook. Just, I, I don't have, at that point, like, what do I have to lose? I won custody. Y'all stole my bank account. You won't contact me, even if I don't know where the problem lies. But what gives you the right to steal a man's bank account? That's why I don't keep any money in the bank. Because banks are, contrary to a weirdly popular belief, banks are not safe. If if a government can just sign a piece of paper and seize it and cut you off from your money, what good is it? But what did any of that, taking your banking account and any of that, have to do with you being a father? Nothing. Nothing. I had just gotten custody of my son. And right before Christmas, I was that close to getting evicted. Did your ex pay you any compliments inside the family court? I don't.
call. Um, you never... probably didn't with her either. No, no. That's what it's about. You're taking two people that had kids and you get them in here slinging mud and we keep the conflict going because that creates the billable hours. And the one person that wins every time that these cases go to family court is the family courts. It's the attorneys. It's the judges. The kids lose every single freaking time. And then um, the parents are just used to keep that money going through there. Before we go, I, I would like to say one thing about that. Yeah, brother. And I've, I don't think I've ever talked about this publicly. Uh, you asked me if, uh, did I pay my ex any compliments in the court? Um, not that I recall, but I will, I will have to say this, and this is just the truth. In my opinion, where she lacked empathy and caused all this crap, that's one side. When it came to the nuts and bolts, feeding, diaper changes, going to the doctor, burping, regular medicine, my children had the best there ever was. I can say that about my ex, too. It was just um, the using the kid as a weapon. Now, arguably, there's some, you know, um, there's a term for it. I, I, Munchausen by proxy. Mm -hmm. Arguably, there was some of that with, you know, doctors. But uh, I would be lying if I said that my kids didn't have at least that. They did. And. I tell my kids that because regardless of what their opinions are of me now or of her now, um, they, I want them to at least say, I, I've told them, you can be secure in yourself knowing, well, my mom's got her faults and the whole world's seen it, but dad told me, and I believe dad, they can take that part with them. You know, at least I, I can focus on this one good thing. Mom was good at, at that part. And and they all know it. Could you have said that 10 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I That's something them. that you as you as consistent. I, I, I told them. Yeah. That's good, man. I I've always I've never trusted people who talk about conflict and they never accept any responsibility for anything bad. I agree. And that's a big problem in this movement. My ex is the worst, and he did that, and she did that. They're just a narcissist. They're awful, and I didn't do anything wrong, or hardly, but everything they did was all wrong. Is that not a red flag? That's a red flag. Uh, I agree. That is I that agree. is exactly why I'm so incredibly open, open yeah. about my shortcomings, particularly with alcohol. I dabbled with alcohol, probably overdrank on weekends a little too much back in the day, but I became, on, on Parker versus the man, I became a full-blown alcoholic, full-blown. I, I was a functioning, I was functioning, very highly functioning. I managed to do five to 6,000 field jobs as a subcontractor mechanic over my 25-year career, and I, I never got DWI. I might have been a little hungover, probably a lot hungover some days. Not I'm, I'm not uh, proud of that at all. In yeah. fact, I'm outright ashamed of it. The decisions I made with almost everything, who to you know date or get in bed with. I mean, you're drunk. It's just oh my god. It is I so. <laughs> it is so humiliating because some people say alcohol reveals who you are. I highly, I highly disagree. Alcohol makes you do things Absolutely. that you wouldn't normally do. I agree with that. And now as of uh, last week, I'm 29 months sober. Awesome, man. And I, I would, I also want to say this. Um, I don't know how much time we've got. Um, we're good, man. We're good. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of changing the subject, but, um, on my 29th anniversary, month anniversary, whatever you want, 29 months of being sober, uh, was the 21st, which was last week or week before last, yeah, last week. <laughs> this was one of the greatest days of my life because th there's only a few days that would beat this. And it was the, the day that I cut each and every one of my kids' umbilical cords. 
wearing the same old navy t-shirt in all four cuttings that i still have it's my most valued prized possession uh the hug i got from london when i picked the kids up after getting out of jail the hug i got from parker whenever he was torn away from me the my 29th uh month of being sober i got to hug my uh I got to hug my parents' necks for the first time in five years. And uh, obviously there was the fact that we went five years without speaking. There was there were problems, but I've learned in that five year separation that we had. And I learned a lot about who I am. Now you I talk learned, about the problems in that five years. Was it all them? No, no, it wasn't. Uh, not to say that, you know, there wasn't. And, and it's, it's not my mom as much. It was my dad. We, I don't want to go into all no. the detail, but it's no big secret. We, we had a lot of arguments and we had a bunch of disagreements, but I'm not going to focus on that, that time apart when I got sober and I started going to the gym which I learned from my own then 18 year old son, Blaine, he's 19 now. And he's just as jacked as I am. Actually, he's probably, he's more jacked. He's, Is he? he's, he's got a little bit better, a little bit better. Mid I'm working than I on do. it. I got, I got some table muscle. Um, he's the one that showed me that, but through the process of getting sober and finding myself with, the gym and hiking all the mountains and seeing the 24, 25 states that I've seen in the last uh, five months I've been gone. I've learned to accept where my father's um, shortcomings were because I had the shortcomings as well. Did you carry some of those on from your dad? Um, some, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, not directly, uh, but yeah, definitely in my own way. And I've, I realized I was holding a grudge for the longest time for reasons that I needed to truly forgive. And if I also realized if I didn't do this, what, what gives my own kids any, any platform any 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 roadmap on how to in the future like say we you know i don't we don't we don't know what's gonna happen in the future right my kids may you know have something out with me um i wanted to i had to make it right and my sister actually reached out to me back in december when it was the first time i'd heard from her in five years and that led to texting mom a little bit and then i finally just flat us flat out said i know there's gonna be some big weird white elephant in the room but uh do you think mom and dad would let me come over sure enough oh well, yeah and uh on my 29th uh celebration of uh 20th month of, of being sober i got to hug my dad what did that do for you it lifted the most magnificent burden off of me um I hate how it turned out with us, but you know what? I can see a lot of my own shortcomings by my dad having that. And it just sounds weird that that example. Yeah, he had his shortcomings and my shortcomings were different than his that I chose to deliberately change. But I still had my shortcomings. I okay. still sucked on that bottle for seven years. I don't I, there's no telling what I missed with my own kids just because I stayed drunk did realizing your own shortcomings uh, give you more understanding and maybe empathy for the shortcomings of your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it did. A, what did sobriety teach you about who you were? Um, who I was, who you was, um, that I was, probably a little cowardly uh, the pain of that we were going through i didn't want to deal with it anymore so would anybody the, have known you were cowardly by looking at you no or especially not at first it's I, masks yeah we put those on yeah. i didn't mean to interrupt you no no you're fine uh you're quite all right it, it was a mask 
but I, I when I was younger, I, it was easier to hide just because you know you're young, you can shake off a hangover a lot easier you know, when you're old. <laughs> you ain't kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it taught me that I I was a little I was cowardly. I didn't want to fully accept my reality. I wanted to dull it with the the most legal drug there is, which happens to be one of the most Worst. deadly drug there is, alcohol. And make no mistake, when people say drugs and alcohol, those are synonymous. Alcohol is a drug. drug. There and are the no ones. health benefits to alcohol whatsoever, short of maybe gargling for a cough, maybe. But I've get, I've gotten rid of coughs way, way better ways than, you know, gargling old crow. You know, I know we probably won't go in that direction too much, but just like CBD, I've heard from veterans and stuff or people that was put on this big pain medicine that this has helped out tremendously. I've never met anybody in my life that told me, Eric, alcohol made my life better. Nope. Not I've, one. I've never heard that. Not I don't one. think I ever will. Not one. Nope. But I'm sure. I can, I can relate almost without fail. Every horrible decision I ever made, including marrying a woman who I was obviously not compatible with, every horrible decision I ever made, almost every one of them had there was alcohol involved. Uh, dude, I love this so much, but you get to go and see your your mom and dad. Uh, you're getting to celebrate this sobriety. You can talk about the shortcomings that you had of yourself. Could you do that before? Were you were were you of the mind where you could um, say that I? I tried to be. You that's uh, that's the reason I didn't cut anything out of the Parker video. Yeah, uh, I didn't edit it because, okay, accuse me of whatever you want, the weed or he'll he'll pray to shoot me or whatever. Um, I, I tr I was I began that journey of trying to be honest and open, but when it came to alcohol addiction, it was humiliating. Once I realized I had a problem and I couldn't, I couldn't quit. I didn't have it up here to quit until 29 months ago. And that is why or where I come from. Alcohol is all up here. You think it's good yeah. at fixing something. It's all up here. You think you can't stop because it's all up here. That's one of my problems with, uh, you know, alcohol is synonymous. Um, I'm not here to, you know, crap on them. I'm glad they're there. I'm glad they help people get off. Yeah. However, this whole submitting uh, to a higher power that you can't even prove is there telling an addict you're an addict. You'll always be an addict. You'll always crave it. So therefore say our little prayer one day at a time to me, that's torture. That is cruel to tell somebody we're going to get you clean, but you're always going to crave it. You got to wake up one day at a time. What I say is that. I am not an alcoholic. I used to be. I am not recovering. I assure you, I am fully, fully recovered. You don't fully. ever want to go back to that life. Hell no. I, I can relate to that uh, so much, man. But like, how liberating is it for you to be able to talk about that openly now? Now? Now that the family court can't dangle my kids in front of me? Oh yeah, you want to get all honest? Yeah, I, you better, you better, you better shut your mouth, Caleb. Quack! We'll just, we'll just yank those kids. There's not a damn thing anybody can do about it now. I can be as open. It is extremely liberating. Absolutely. Same way with psychedelics. I'm way open about being a huge fan of psychedelics. Well, and that might be a conversation, you know, that's another one. Ten years ago, people would have probably been closed off to that. Yeah. I think Joe Rogan's actually helped a lot with that. Oh, I really absolutely. have. Absolutely. We see what like CBD and psilocybin mushrooms and stuff is going for the veterans and stuff. And I think they need to look more into it. I really do. But at yeah. least we are in a society now where if there's something that can help you out there, People are actually talking about it. At one point in time, they would have thought this was just crazy. Yeah, it's crazy because uh, Nancy Reagan did this country a huge, gigantic disservice by saying, just say no and lumping all drugs into the same psilocybin, uh, uh, cannabis, lumping all that in with cocaine or yes, fentanyl or, you know, name your alcohol. 
Name your horrible, horrible drug that anybody in their right mind that likes physical fitness and climbing mountains would never in a million years touch. Uh, dude, so, so they so they lumped it all together because I grew up thinking, oh, LSD, I, I, that just sounds scary. I mean, marijuana, mar marijuana. Oh, that dude, I, I I think most people probably equated marijuana to like crack cocaine. Yep. You know, because it was just drugs. This it's a gateway drug. drug. This is your drugs with a side order of bacon and seeing the scrambled eggs and everything. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that was the propaganda that came, uh, you know, back then. But I do believe. You know, I think why this is such an important conversation are our veterans with PTSD. They're, they're showing some great improvement with this. But you can't tell me some of these guys, especially like what you've been through with some of these wars, aren't facing that same trauma and that same. Yeah. Yeah. And but in the part of the reason I never did use cannabis or never did try psychedelics, because what happens if you get caught in a piss test? Oh, yeah. You just kiss it goodbye. You'll never see your kids again. Yeah. It's that easy. Oh, uh, I, I suspect he's uh, drunk. I suspect he's doing marijuana. He's got some. Uh, uh, I, I want a drug test. Judge, your honor, I don't need a drug test. Piss and uh, and hair follicles. There's a way to get the upper hand. Yep. Yeah. And so if you got to escape reality, which I totally get, what's the good, what's the reliable legal way? Booze. It's everywhere. It's on every street corner. It's on every college campus. Yep. It's promoted at colleges. It's promoted at sports events. Keep them all drunk. Keep them all stupid. Keep them all mind numbed. Keep them all fat. Keep them all lazy. Keep them depressed and they won't fight back. Well, guess what? We're fighting back. Exactly. I'm getting in shape. I've only started this and I, I I've lost I got went from 221 down to 172. I'm back up to about 190, 189, it's 190. Muscle. It's all muscle. Oh, dude, I gotta get that done. <laughs> I'm working on it sitting in this chair. It's yep. done a number on me, man. And guys, you gotta take care of your health. I mean, you do. That was something I don't think us as men talk about enough. You know, it was another men's rights guy that was talking to me not long ago. He's like, Eric, when's the last time you got a full panel done and checkup? I was like, I don't know. And he was like, man, you're 38 years old. Your testosterone starts leaving everything. You need to go get checked up. When's the last time you had a prostate exam? I'm like, man, why are you talking to me about this? But it's one of those stigmas that we've made. Men are so far more likely to die because they don't take care of themselves. They don't go to the doctors. They don't work out. They don't eat right. And I'm just getting fast food because I'm at work and in between. We need to start encouraging our guys with some of these other conversations, especially you guys that are fighting these family law battles that are wanting to drown out your sorrows with the bottle. Um, so, yeah, as you see, I got my bruise right here. I went and got my blood drawn yesterday and I'm practicing what I preach. And I wanted to pay that for it. I'm glad that we can have conversations like this, guys. And look. You know, how much different has that made your life now that you're getting in shape? What's that done for you up here? Oh, night and day. Uh, yeah, dude. When I, I walk it, down I the it. street or when I walk <laughs> into a room, people look at me completely different. Confidence. Yeah. Confidence goes a long way. It goes a long way. It does. Yeah. And then the people that don't want you to have confidence, they'll try to call it ego. You got to have confidence mm -hmm. to get where you're at. One, one thing I was curious about, though, I want to go back to the addiction battle. Okay. Now that you're 29 months sober. How many people have tried to still equate you to the addict? How many people have tried to use your past against you, even though you're beyond it? Have you had any of that? Um, not really. Uh, my haters, my my trolls on my on my channel, yeah, yeah. Oh, he, he admitted he's an alcoholic. See, I'm like, but I'm also saying I'm not an alcoholic anymore. Well, once you're an alcoholic, you're an always alcoholic. I'm like, I don't drink. Uh, well, how much do you drink? Well, I mean, just on weekends, what's it? So you're a drinker. You know, I'll get a lawyer on them. Yeah. So, so, you, so, you're, so you are a drinker. <laughs> well, just no, but I don't abuse it like you did. You're, you're admitted alcoholic. I said, well, you drink on weekends and I don't drink at all. But you're saying that I'm the alcoholic and you're not. Does that really make sense to you? <laughs> and so, no, I've, I've had a few people try to throw it back, but not really. Well, again, it's not like, what are you going to do? Sue me? T steal my kids? <laughs> okay. Go right ahead. <laughs> well, don't do any good. My kids are grown. We don't have to see each other every day. We, I built the foundation. I showed up when I had to. We built the foundation and, you know, press history. I'm, I'm fine with how things are now.
How are the kids doing now? They are good. Um, I can't talk yeah, about not. too much about their personal lives. I am open about <clears throat> part. Parker is now a professional horse trainer. He specializes in starting colts. In, oh, uh, cool, man. Yeah, that's the wilder, the better. The most, the more untouched by human a young colt is, the more he loves it. And he's really good at it. Um, I don't mind saying that. Um, yeah. The boys, uh, the, the other two, they, they live in my Okeechobee house. They've got jobs. They're finding out who they are. Uh, London still, she's 17 and a half. She still lives with her mom. Um, there's some rub there. I can't really go. That's okay. I can't really go into. Uh, health wise, everything's good. Yeah. Yeah. Doing yeah. good. Health wise. Still in contact. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you know, one of the thoughts, you know, again, watching that video yesterday, it was 10 years ago, but it's everybody can relate to it just as much now as they did back then. I've been doing this three and a half. This is going on year four. And I can't tell you how many times along the way I'm like, I don't want to look at this crap anymore. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to see it. How have you stayed in there for 10 years talking about this? I know it's not easy at times. Um, I stayed in there that long, mostly. Well, this last five years, the only reason I stayed in it is because I started this mess so long ago. And then, like I said, until December 6th of last year, my file still wasn't updated. Blaine was a grown man at 19 years old. I got him when he was 14. He was 19 years old before it finally got updated. I had I felt like if I backed off now, they are going to eat me alive wow. yeah. if i backed off and come to find out um uh, the attorney general's office of texas their own lawyer called me said mr leverett my name is so-and-so and i'm yeah kind of familiar with your story a little bit <laughs> i bet you are i bet you know i don't <laughs> like your boss very much either don't you yeah. i've i've heard mr leverett <laughs> But uh, even he told me, you've got about at least a $13,000 credit coming. And I intend to present that to the judge and say, Mr. Leverett does not owe that. That was a mistake. And sure enough, I'll have to give Debbie Paxton. Uh, he's at least got one uh, honorable person that works in his, uh, in his department. And I'll give him that. Well, two. There's another one. I wound up uh, recording a man by the name of Robert Green. Uh, who called me illegally, I might add, before, uh, while I still had a, a, a retainer with a lawyer. He was another good guy. He seemed like he worked, he just wanted to help Odessa, where I'm from, he wanted to help them catch up. He's out of Amarillo. So there's two guys that I talked to within that department. They're just, it's, it's like I, sh I could shake their hand and I, they're like, we get it. You, you made your yeah. point. We we you're we were wrong here. We had to get this fixed, and they they fixed it. So I I would have to give uh, Debbie Paxton's crew you know a pat on the back. They did do at least those two guys did. Is there any way they can make up to you uh, anything that happened in the past? Would an apology an mean apology would go a long ways. A public apology would go a long ways with Paxton, and not only Paxton, but my own uh, kid's mother and simp dad. People tell me, Kayla, you got to let this go. You got to let it go. You got to forgive and Jesus forgive. And A, don't talk to me about Jesus when I know very few actual Christians that actually live by the teachings of Christ. I agree. So that's, <laughs> you know, that's just my little agnostic plug there. But uh, yeah, a, an apology would go a long, a very public apology would go a long way and if i don't get the apology um i'm quite all right with disliking the, the system still and disapproving of simping for a woman and disciplining her kids when their father is there is involved in their life i'm quite okay with being very vocal about uh not growing up aspiring to be that guy so is is the simp dad and and her still together as far as you know? I 
You don't know. As far don't, as, work. don't know, don't care as far I as I got you. As far as I know, I guess. I guess he just like standing there with his arms crossed and uh, as much as he wants to look like an intimidating figure, all I can see is like reminds me of a puppet. Tell me you saw Peter Griffin. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to unsee it now. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, that has been a running joke in the comment section has for it? 10 years. Uh, that Peter Griffin looking mofo. Well, come to find out, I would start joking about it because once my kids got grown, I could say whatever I want. I couldn't care less. A Twitter person heard me talking about it, and somebody on Twitter made a cartoon about that famous scene where, you know, it's Parker and his mother and, you know, Peter Griffin over there, Mr. Billy Badass in the permit. <laughs> so in this cartoon, it's this angry looking mother character and Peter Griffin's off in the back for the houses in a permeant football shirt. I'm going to have to watch this one. <gasps> Well, it's just a picture. Now, whoever, uh, whoever this Twitter user is, they they vowed to make a full-blown cartoon of this using the audio from the Parker movie. If they got my permission to do so, I said, by all means. Go for it. I cannot wait to see this gold mine. How long so, ago was this? Um, About a month. Oh, please so, do it. Please so, do it. Mr. Twitter Universe, whoever you are, uh, that person, I, I followed them, I think. I, I don't remember their username, but yeah. Um, I cannot wait to see this gold. So absolutely, man. So I definitely want to get into the next chapters uh, of this story. Ten years you've been speaking out. Uh, you're still doing it. Why? Why are you still doing it? Um, now it's just kind of who I am. Um, I've been doing it so long now. Um, I don't really have a lot to gain from as far as my kids or anything anymore. But uh. It's really nice to be beyond where millions of single parents are right now. They're tied. They can't speak up. Yep. They can't uh, potentially get psilocybin to help their anxiety and their depression. They can't um, afford lawyers. They can't afford to uh, take a camera because they're afraid they'll get they're just living in fear and it feels really nice to be in the position to say, hang in there. You will get through this. Don't make the mistakes I made and stay drunk. Um, in the meantime, I can go out there and I can say just about anything I want now. And there's no repercussions because a, it's all provable. It's all true. I can, I've literally got, you know, doc, I've documented yeah. this. Anything I say is going to be something I can prove. How much different would your case have been if you didn't have that video? I don't know. I, I, I've often wondered that. I say the same thing about Johnny Depp. What would his case have been like had he not had that recording of Amber mm. admitting to hitting him and what he had? Because I believe it would have went in a much different area. Guys, you got this now. If you're in a state where you can use it, use it. Even if you're not in a state where you can use it, you can use it. Now, maybe there's illegal, but uh, laws. To Check your laws, that. but we're we're encouraging. I'll, that you I, use I, it. I'll say this: uh, my my oldest lawyer was actually my divorce lawyer original. She's actually my third grade girlfriend. She told me this. She said, "Caleb, um, many many years ago, I cannot tell you to lie or to break the law, but I can tell you." It is not against the law to record your own conversation, and I'll leave it at that. There you go. Guys, we're not attorneys. We're not giving you legal advice, but we're having conversation. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Is that not gold? <laughs> uh, I, I just want about permission to make... A sticker on Dad Talk with that Peter Griffin. <laughs> you got it. For you me. get the membership, <laughs> and you'll get the Permian Football Simp Daddy. The Simp Daddy. Oh my God, this is this is gold, man. I will never look at that the same. I, I laugh uncontrollably hard. I, I think I peed my pants just a little bit. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> 
And if he actually comes through with it and makes the, the full-blown animated cartoon, you can bet your sweet little hiney I'm going to be broadcasting it. I can't wait. Ah, uh, dude. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, Caleb, let me ask you, though, man, I, and I'm, I'm glad we're getting into this. I'll have one more question on that before we get out of here. What's next? I know you've got some pretty bang ambitions. You've sobered up. Mm -hmm. You're getting into shape. Uh, you're going to continue to speak out behind these issues and guys, let's, you know, give a hand to a guy that he, he's beyond the system. A lot of people get beyond it and they say, it's not my worry anymore. And they just go away. You have something here that, uh, so many people can relate to. So I'm glad that you're still speaking up about it. However, you're wanting to take some new steps in your life. Yes. Tell us, tell us about some of the plans you got coming up. I have decided that I have got to finish finding out who I am. Mm. And the way I've chosen to do it is uh, for me, uh, tentatively, this coming March 21st, I'm going to attempt to hike the entire Appalachian Trail, starting at, uh, I think it's called Springer Mountain in northern Georgia. The Appalachian Trail goes from Springer Mountain all the way to uh, Catadon Mountain, I believe, Mount Canada or something like that in Maine. And it's like 21 to 2300 miles, depending on which route you take. Uh, you can take breaks as long as you register from the beginning. They call it Nobo or Northbound. As long as you register and you complete it all the way to Catadon within the calendar year, you get like street cred for it. And it's basically you pack a backpack, 20 to 30 pounds, whatever I think I can carry, tent, food, the bare essentials, great hiking legs, and you just start start hiking. And I'm going to be documenting it the entire way. Uh, this firm that I've uh, partnered up with out of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Sacramento, California, we're working to where I'm literally going to be getting basically it's it's an Apple pod tracker to deal. Basically a dog tag where you can if you uh, as far as if you sign up under under I think we're either going to do memberships on YouTube and or uh, uh, Patreon. You can track me my every move on the trail. And what my hopes are is I've announced this a little bit lightly on my Facebook and I, I keep my Facebook separate from my YouTube because you it's just a different pe set of people. It's, I know a lot, most of those people personally. Yeah. But I, I've had a, just an insane amount of people saying, hey, if you're on you know, this state or in this state, here's a, I'm by the trail. I'm by the trail. I'd love to come meet up with you. Nice, and cool, I man. would love to meet even more uh, friends of mine that I've never met in real life. Uh, Facebook friends of mine or just uh, people who found me on YouTube. If you are uh, watching on the app, um, tracking me and you want to come hang out and hike for half a day or a day or a couple days, or um, I just think it'd be fun because on this trip, I have met a bunch of people that I've known on Facebook for literally 10, 12 years and never met them in person until this trip. Like, um i'd say close to a dozen people i've, I've gotten i mean uh hell Dwayne's one of them i mean he and i've known each other for i don't know four or five years maybe i've he and uh joseph and uh uh help help me out Dwayne. uh who else was there um uh what do you say what'd you say alan alan, alan? Yeah, yeah yeah alan I, i'm those are three of them right off the bat i'd never even met um, so it's neat, man. It's fun. It, it, it's neat. You know, when we did our trip across the country, we, we told everybody what capitals we were going to be at. Cause we want them to walk it with us. Don't just sit there and watch us on Facebook live. Come out. There yeah. were so many people that end up watching this show. And I think you'll probably end up seeing the same thing. I didn't know him until I met him in person. Mm -hmm. He's like, we watch every show. There was one that knew that my favorite food was pizza and brought me two large pizzas. <laughs> when we was in New Hampshire and dude, all kinds of groceries. And I'm like, I've never even met this guy. Amazing, dude. Yep. And, you know, that is one good thing that our movement has now that, you know, went, you know, 15, 20 years ago, 
we got the social media. We got the opportunities to do stuff mm -hmm. like this. And I can understand that going to find yourself. Uh, what is it about that journey that you think you're going to find? Um, you ain't got that far. The meaning of life. The meaning of Why life. Why are we all here? Where did we come from? I've come to realize that I'll probably never get an answer, but I'm okay with not having an answer just as much as I'm okay with seeking the answer anyway. Um, again, just being able to hug my parents for the first time in five years. Mm -hmm. um, I had a hardened heart at one time. I softened it in the places it needed to be softened. And I'm thankful because now I'm on speaking terms with my parents. I mean, my dad and I, we, we, we text each other back and forth now. Just, just random stuff. Nothing, nothing deep necessarily or anything. Just, just text, just talk. Yeah. And I don't know. It's just nice. I mean, if I can be sober 29 months and I can be in the gym, this is only me in 13 months in the gym. This is, I've lost all the weight and gained back all muscle back down to one night. That's all 13 months. If I can do this much in 13 months, what can I do hiking 2,300 miles? What's that going to do? Sleeping out in the elements, freezing my ass off, trudging through the mud, uh, seeing the beautiful scenery, uh, not having a shower for a week. I, I don't know what it's going to do. Uh, figuring out a way to, you know, keep my every all everything charged and take pictures and do my vlogs and do my go live occasionally. I will be going live. Awesome. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's there you go, man. That, that's where that's where I'm at. So if you if you're not subscribed to my channel, I would love. And I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I have plug for you on my community. Oh section. no, dude, you're good. Yeah, I, you're good. I want you to watch it. Go subscribe. <laughs> ring the bell, just like this. I'm, I'm planning on talking with Caleb much more in the future, man. And it's about, you know, we should all be working together. Sometimes the infighting and stuff in the community, you know, this is my show. This is this. I don't get in for that crap. And then the the I want it to be over with, dude. Yeah. And I can tell you just from the first time that I talked to you till now, I can see how much more vulnerable and uh, just like, at peace you are. Mm -hmm. I think what the, the last time I talked to you, you were still in the midst of the battle. You were talking about getting more involved politically, and you seemed pretty heated up about it. I was. It's like a I completely sober, different person, man. Yeah. Whenever I hugged my mother uh, last week. Melted away. She hugged me, and she just hugged me over, bawling, of course. And she just said, she just grabbed me, and she just said, I just can't believe what, honey, what you've done with your body and your eyes are so clear. It's like, I know, mom, like it really, I really changed who I am. I had to hit rock bottom and I just, once I made up my mind, I'm going to be healthy. I want to no longer be a drunk. I want to be somebody that my kids can look at someday and say, you know what? That old man, he, he, he was weird. He's, Dad did some really strange things with thing, but God dang, look at him. He's climbing mountains. I wanted to be somebody my kids could be proud of. To your kids, your friends, your family, anybody that met you when you were still in that spot before you got to where you yeah, are now. My mother, what, could you say to, what could you say to them about that time versus who you are now? I'm sure there was a lot that went on during that period of time. There's been a lot of transformation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will always associate you with that guy that was five or 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, people change. Uh, I didn't used to think that. Yeah. But they don't change if outside influence wants them to change. I only ultimately changed when I made up my mind I wanted to change. You were the only one holding it back. I was holding myself back. Yeah, yeah I, me too. <laughs> I was holding myself back. Dude, that's a powerful statement to be able to say. Well, the, the power is the power of our minds. It is. We, we were told our whole life, once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. People believe that shit. I'm telling you, don't believe that shit. Stop with the alcohol. Change your mind. Accept it. The reality that is true, a provable fact that alcohol is poisonous to humans. Once you make up your mind, it is, it's so easy to stay quit. I'm not tempted by it. Uh, you could peer pressure me all you want. I used to say I wouldn't 
you couldn't pay me enough to get drunk, but actually you could. If someone wants to offer me like, you know, 25,000 bucks to get shit faced hammered in like a social experiment, I will get shit faced hammered drunk <laughs> live for 25,000 bucks. But you know what I won't do? I won't do it the next day for 50. I wouldn't do it the next day after that for 100. Because I'll, I'm for a little bit amount of money that would put me into a better place financially, especially since the crypto market's down and we're looking to the bull run, 25 grand. Yeah, I'll sacrifice a little bit of my brain cells one night to prove that I can get hammered one night if I really am stupid enough to want to do it. And the next day, not be hooked because I've already told myself, I've convinced myself, I've made up my mind, alcohol is poisoning to the human body. Therefore, the next day, I will. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be tempted. I promise you. I guarantee it. That's why it's you know advocates definitely uh, relate more to other advocates, whereas I say addicts relate more to other addicts. I was that guy, so I'm relating to what you're saying here. But dude, I've been sober now for 13 years. Oh wow! And I was a uh, well done. Thanks, man. Well I was uh, alcohol was one of my problems too. And I could drink a half a gallon of Jim Beam and still be wanting to go, dude. That's how bad it was. I had trouble with opiates, you name it. Um, 13 years later, anybody that that goes around with me on Dad Talk can tell you, you know, you, you go to these political functions, especially. The politicians drink more than rock stars. Mm. <laughs> you guys might not believe that. But politicians, the attorneys, and the judges, and stuff, they drink way more than anything yeah. that you're going to see at the parties. And they would, you know, everybody try to hand me a glass of wine or a beer. I don't want, yeah. but there's been several times if I'm in that social setting, like, okay, give me a glass of wine. I can sip on it a couple of times or drink a half a beer. And I'm just like, I do not want it. Yeah. So you can't say once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, because it doesn't tempt me at all anymore. Yeah. Even if I sit there and sip on it and drink on it. Now, if I was planning on getting drunk, I'm one of those that just wants to keep going. But dude, I want nothing to do with it. Even, I'm not I, bound by those chains. And I think the more that you can speak up about it. You can't climb mountains if you're drunk. I no. promise you that. Oh, yeah. I've hit close to 14,000 feet, like uh, Cloud Peak. I promise you. There's people who say, oh, Caleb, he fall. He's fell, he fall, he fell off the wagon again. I'm like, you don't. And this, oh, this, this pisses off my haters. But you, you don't look like me. You don't have a body like this if you fall off the wagon. You can't climb to the top of Cloud Peak, backpacking all the way up and all the way down in one day if if I fell off the wagon, if you're not call it. So if I love the outdoors so much. There's such a gigantic, beautiful scenery in God's green earth that I haven't seen yet. Oh, yeah, man. And why in the world would I want to punish my body? by getting hammered again and miss out on a hike miss out on a trail that's another cool thing about meeting all these people i've, I've tried my best you know, i'd sleep in my tent or in my car it's hard to sleep in a mustang but i've done it many nights but i tried to stay with you know friends that i've known for years that watched me go through all that crap that i had never met i stayed with i don't know at least a, maybe half a dozen people's uh, houses. And the cool thing about that is I can use them as a testimony. Okay. So, and so you're with me for 24, 36 hours, three days a week. Did you at any point ever, ever see me reach for the bottle? Cause an addict, you know, they're going to go, if they're, they're an gonna addict, go find it. they're going to find it and they're going to yep. sneak it. Nope. Same way with the boys. When they came to live with me in Okeechobee at the Okeechobee house in Florida, Hayden, I need you to be my witness. You and Blaine have lived there in this. I mean, I no kidding. Uh, your studio is about this, about this 400 square feet. Yeah, well, I think we had about five, 525, 525. Between three of us. I said, Have you ever seen me drinking here? No. Have you ever seen any, any kind of bottles whatsoever? Uh, no. Uh, do you think you would have noticed if I had a problem? You've been here for like, I don't know, like six months now. You'd have seen, Dad, you're fine. I promise you. Anyone that ever, I've lived with you, this is Hayden Dog. I've lived with you six months. I can be your witness. You're, you're clean. It's nice to have good character witnesses. Uh, it's, well, it's just nice, especially if it's your own kid. It definitely is, man. And you know, there's, there's something much different, you know, when getting sober 
all that stuff that you've now gotten off your mind, hugging your parents, you know, getting beyond the family law battle, all that helps. You know, it sounds like mm -hmm. you're at peace now. And I'm, I'm uh, excited about seeing the journey that you got coming up. Thanks. I can tell you're excited. Oh, about my it. God. I'm just chomping at the bit. All right, you got to wait until March. Yeah, look, it, dude, look at this. Look at this right here. Dwayne's already yep. got it pulled up. Yep. That, I'm going to be starting. Yeah. Right down there in northern Atlanta uh, or yeah, northern Atlanta. I think it's called Springer Mountain. And it goes through about 13 or 14 states. The last four, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and one more, Massachusetts. I have no, I think those are the last four states that I've not ever uh, either been to at all. And not only am I going to go there, or that's the goal, if I make it, I'll be walking through those states. Oh, I see. You're going to get nice a good view. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what do you do? So, yeah. That's nuts, man. But that is cool. Is that it? is a journey worth doing. That's something you'll never forget. Yeah. What the cooler thing about it is there's two more trails that are just as insanely treacherous. One's called the Continental Divide Trail. Right. goes right up down the middle of yeah. the continent. And then one's called the Pacific Crest Trail. And if you register with all three of them and complete them all in or each one in one calendar year or less, then you get a note a uh, like a banner or you know street cred for what's known as a triple crown and so i don't know maybe i'll get a triple crown i, I have no, I, I might die on this i mean i don't know no nah, i but think you'll be all right i think it's highly unlikely but it is possible I mean, it's right? always possible i mean we could we could die as soon as we walk out of the studio i think that's, this this is kind of got like a where's waldo element to it yeah like you guys should find caleb on the trail and take pictures and send it to me so i can post it up there yeah we're like, we're we're <laughs> my marketing team out of sacramento we're talking about that like hashtag where in the world's caleb leverett or you know where or like carmen san diego uh, oh that was that I, okay that was my generation i think that was that was after you growing up i don't know what that is it was a show when i was growing up carmen where in the world is Carmen San Diego? No, I don't know her. How old are you now? 45. 45. Oh, you're not too much older than me. Yeah. No. Nah. You don't remember that show? Carmen said no. You guys remember where in the world is Carmen San Diego, right? I remember, you know, where's Waldo, WW. Where's Waldo, too? Yeah. Or, That's cool, man. Or what would. So you're going to be wearing like a. a WWJD, a, a, what would Jesus do? What would Caleb do? Where would Caleb be? <laughs> I love referring to myself as Christ sometimes because it just aggravates some people because they think I'm serious. Yeah. And I'm not. I'm not serious. I just, just, I mean, it sounds so peaceful that I'm actually kind of jealous that I can only imagine those moments when you're by yourself in, in your head and getting that clarity out in nature, the things that you're going to find out. Yeah. I spent uh, three nights up in the, at the, the, the Bighorn National Forest in Northeastern Wyoming in my tent with no cell service and it was amazing how refreshing it is it's so quiet yeah unbelievably quiet same way with the uh, um same way with the um, yellowstone at night you could hear a pin drop and then you like i got out to pee one night and it was so quiet. I could hear the blood pumping in my head. And then all of a sudden I hear this, this, this elk bugling, an elk started bugling and it just pierced the silence. There is nothing more beautiful than maybe the birth of your own child. And I think that is big one. Are you going to do any maybe. hunting? Um, no, um, it's I got I, another element to it too. Man. I, I I grew up hunting. Did you? I, yeah, I grew up deer hunting on my my favorite Uncle Dale's ranch down in Sheffield, Texas. Okay, I, I loved it. Um, you can't really carry weapons. No, and, no, that's true. I mean, I mean, you could if you wanted to, but just uh, the weight alone. Well, and they'll treat you like Rambo too. Here's another drifter. Put them in. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I'm just. I, I just I don't want the weight. Um, yeah. The, the Appalachian Trail is so common now. They've got what's called trail angels. Like people expect you. They, they know when they're coming through. And people like 
come out and cheer you on and hand you little, you know, snack packs or something like that. And they call them trail angels. It's just, you know, people doing good deeds just for perfect strangers. I think it's really, really cool. How did you enjoy Yellowstone? Oh, I loved it. Oh, I did. So I fell in love. As soon as you get out of Cody, Wyoming, and you're heading in, you cross that that border. It's just like you're entering into a, another t place in time. So funny thing is I went through Yellowstone. Uh, it's been about three or four months ago. And when I'm doing all this traveling, people think I'm getting to see all these states. No, I'm working. And we, we drove 2,700 miles in five days going and seeing all these supervised visitation centers when I was up in the Northwest. Oh, wow. But we started passing through Yellowstone. And John Massfather was with me. And I was like, man, I want to see the geysers. I was like, can we at least see that while we're here? And we pull into Yellowstone. I'm thinking, like, we're just going to pour right up here and see the geysers. And uh, I asked the lady, I was like, you know, which way do I go to the geysers? She's like, 200 miles this way. Like, what? Mm -hmm. I didn't know Yellowstone was that big. It is huge. <laughs> I thought it was literally five minutes away. And I was like, how long does it take to do the park? She's like, four days. Had no idea, dude. Yeah. So I didn't get to see the geysers. Did you get to see the geysers? I hiked every trail. Oh, there's like, there's man. like, there's like twenty of them. Yeah. Or more than that within you know a mile or two of each other. Of course, Old Faithful being the most famous, but they've got hiking trails all over, and I hiked every damn one of them. Absolutely. I've documented all on my channel. Um. Yeah, that was that. That was amazing, breathtaking. Guys, go check this out, man, and, and see uh, Caleb's journey. This might be something that inspires you to want to do something uh, very similar. Uh, Caleb Leverett, they're on YouTube, and it sounds like he's got a lot of content that's coming up, and I appreciate you for staying on in here, man. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. 521,000 subscribers, man. That's a pretty good-sized channel, brother. Yeah, and that, the new artwork, that's courtesy. Uh, we just got that part going. Uh, uh, they had that design i'm humbly shocked at how much work goes into properly doing a youtube channel wow dude each social media platform that we have to do is a full-time job instagram's a full-time job facebook's a full-time job youtube's a full-time job and in the meantime especially with this family law stuff i'm sure you can relate everybody's wanting to tell their story you got all these people that are in your messages or trying to call you. You can't keep up with it. Yeah. No, and man. To give them, and the sad part is to give them proper advice on what you would do, you'd have to spend hours and hours and hours like a therapist, yeah. of which I'm, A, not qualified to do, and B, even if I was qualified to do, I can't charge for my time. Right. And because, uh, unfortunately, so many people that are in our shoes, they're just like us when we were there we're broke that's it man and, and, and you know it, it, and so it, I, i'm like you I, I i i hate it because i do feel sorry for them but i just um, i have to i've learned to set my own limitations i can't get personally involved with Every everybody man. that wants to call me and tell me their story I've, i wished i could but that, i just can't that's the part that dragged me down man because you want to help but you can't save the world man you, you can't set yourself on fire trying to be there for everybody else but i mean i'll be honest with you if you guys just watch that video everybody's sitting back that's my ex already you know if we could get one of these stories to get out there and then they can see what's going on i just I have hopes one day that this movement is going to be able to move forward and we're finally going to see that movement uh, going. That's the magic of Dwayne, by the way. He, oh, my God. I'm actually my Mustang. This was just last year. And then he superimposed that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> Peter Griffin. Oh, my God. Yeah. I see it. You can't unsee it. No, you can't unsee it. You oh. can't unsee it one bit. <laughs> well, guys, we've been going for a couple hours now, Caleb. It was a, a pleasure getting to meet your brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this hike. Guys, you got to, you know, you talk about the collar that you got on. You went all those years being an alcoholic and you never had to wear an ankle monitor. Mm -hmm. And now that you're sober, you're going to put a monitor on so people can track you. Yep. And if you're like some bored FBI agent on the desk duty, you get to track me in real time and watch my every move. There you go. If you want to. <laughs> there you go, guys. Um, 
Really quick, though, before we get out of here, Caleb, um, if there was anything you could say to one of these advocates that are now starting their journey, they're back to where you was 10 years ago, and you knew then what you know now, what could you say to them? Stay sober. Don't, whatever level of worry you're worrying about, at least cut it in half. At least, I started to say, don't worry at all, but that's silly. We all we all have our little bit of worries. But if worrying is something that holds you back, at least cut it in half. Because most of the things you are worried about, as long as you'll just show up, you don't have, you can uh, make frequent contact and have some continuity there. A lot of things that I would worry about never even came to fruition. And I, so I base I worried about absolutely nothing. When you worry, you put stress on your body. When you stress, you get depressed. You're looking for another way out. So I would say cut your worry in half, completely get sober. That, that is not going to help you. Again, like you said, I don't I've, like you. I've never met not one person that say, you know what? Whew, that alcohol just saved my ass. No, it never, it. no one ever says that. And a lot of our guys, that's where they go. Yep. Because well, it's, because it's, it's legal. It's, it's legal. Like, we, like you it's, just said, it's, a it's, quick solution. it's the politician's drug of choice. That's, it is. that's why it's legal. That's it is. what they prefer. Yeah. I mean, they pro- prohibited it and then they, they brought it back. So, mm-hmm. and it's not going anywhere, but uh, well, I appreciate that, man. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to get out that maybe I haven't asked any questions about? Um, no, the main thing is my, I'm just flipping over a new leaf. I'm going on the trail. Uh, we're, I'm working with my firm out of uh, Sacramento. Uh, it's going to take some time to get all the updates and all the, you know, the stuff behind the scenes done. Um, no, that pretty much, uh, I got. I, I, I want to thank you for letting me. I want to get that in about my parents because um, some people watch this. That you know, hometown people. They 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 knew that there was some you know tension tension there, and I took it a little too far in some areas. But I'm, I'm I wanted to get, especially on your platform. I wanted to get it out there that that was just the greatest hug. Uh, since I cut my own kids in both cords, hugging my dad and then my mom. So, uh, no, I mean, that that's it. I I appreciate you having me on. It's good to finally meet you. Yeah, brother. Like in real life. How much you love your mom and dad? Like this much. This much? No, this much. That much? That much, mama. Uh, I, love, I love you that much, mama and dad. Promise. <laughs> Sorry I'll put added a few gray hairs to y'all. Um, it's coming back. It's, I'm getting it on myself as well. All right, guys. Well, I enjoyed this so much. Uh, Thank you for tuning in and make sure to like, share, subscribe. Many ways you can support the podcast. I said them earlier in the show. I probably need to say it more. I hate advertising it, but guys, we have to to do what we're doing here. We We want to be able to do more for you. In order to be able to do more for you, we got to ask the community to chip in and help us. Okay. But love you guys. Hope you have a good weekend and we'll see you tomorrow morning. We got Mr. Jimmy Smith. When 18 years of his life, thinking that stepdad, Peter Griffin, was his actual dad, only to find out mom had moved him out of the country, changed his I name, saw that. changed his name. And then when they went to get a divorce, when uh, stepdad was 18, she said, oh, he was a horrible guy and he wasn't your daddy anyway. Jimmy's like, what? Runs back over here to find his real dad and his, his real dad had died two years prior and he found out through people that knew him, his real dad had never, never stopped, stopped looking stopped for him. Man. Uh, you're have him on tomorrow? Tomorrow. Yeah. His I'll... former WWE guy, too. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. You're talking about being jacked, man. He's like a, he's a physical trainer and stuff, too. Badass. Uh, hell, yeah, dude. So, and, and you know what? I think a lot of times we, we hear from the ladies that, that were deprived of that relationship with their dad uh, or was lied to. But seeing this big, strong man sitting there saying, I was lied to and I wanted that relationship with my dad. We got to break these stereotypes and narratives, guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think that's going to be a powerful one. So we'll see you at 10 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. And uh, 
Adios. See you next time, guys. Take care. Hey, everybody. Eric Carroll here. Thank you for tuning in to another exciting episode of Dad Talk Today. While we fight for you, we would ask for you to please help fight for us. Like, subscribe to our channel, and ring that bell so you get notifications every time we go live. There's also Super Chat, patreon.com slash dadtalktoday, and other ways you can support our channel. Thank you for being here, and we will see you next.